everyone. I'm very happy to be speaking about MVVM Lite for the first time in Southeast Asia. So hope we'll have more talks like that. Um, so I'm going to show you how to build truly universal applications using Xamarin, Windows, and MVVM. Um, why truly universal? Well, it's a little bit of a jab at Microsoft because Microsoft speaks about universal applications that run on Windows. So they are universal as long as you're on Windows, right? And of course, if you're truly universal, you also need mobile, and mobile these days means iOS and uh, Android. So I'm going to show that to you, and a few words about myself. My name is Laurent Bunion. I uh, come from Switzerland. I used to work for a firm called Valorem. I worked for them for quite a few years. We did a lot of client applications and also back-end applications. And recently, in case you've been following me on Twitter or something, you might have seen that I'm working for Microsoft now. So I joined August 1st, and uh, I've been starting to make talks as well in Microsoft Names. So this is um, quite a big change for me. I used to be a Windows Platform Development MVP for 11 years, and I used to be Xamarin MVP, and I used to be a regional director, and now I have to give this all up because you can be that and also an MVP, and also a, a full-time employee at Microsoft, sorry. So I'm an alumni now. I'm a, I am still a Xamarin certified mobile developer, though. And uh, I'm the author of MVVM Lite, which we'll use in the demos. So this is a landscape of devices that we support these days. Um, with Windows, everything from phones, there are still a few of those available. Hope to see more soon. All the way to holographic, and so in true, it's true that those uh, universal Windows platform applications, you can actually run them on HoloLens, for example. Then you will see them float in front of you like a 2D billboard. Uh, it's a pretty cool effect, and you don't need to change anything to your application. You just publish it to the store. You say, this is a HoloLens application as well, and then it will be uh, available for download. Of course, Xbox, Surface Hub, those are interesting scenarios. Heavily multi-touch uh, for Surface Hub, Xbox. You can run applications from your, um, from your sofa. When I was uh, working for Valorem, we did Pizza Hut, for example, which was pretty fun. It's an application where you can order your pizza without having to stand up from your sofa. And um, in uh, the first two months, they made one million benefit with that application, which was really cool. The only thing is that you still have to stand up from your sofa to answer the door when the guy delivers a pizza. Unfortunately, we didn't have a solution for that. But that said, the beta testing of the application was cool because we ate a lot of pizza, so that was fun. Anyway, so this is cool, but of course, if you want to support mobile, then you need iOS and Android. And Xamarin in that uh, regard is a very good solution because it's going to allow you to share a lot of your code. And so before we go on, I'd like to recap a little bit. And so we talk about design patterns, model view controller, MVC is a very classic pattern, and then MVVM, what is the difference, and why would you want one or the other, okay? So the MVC pattern is a very, very old pattern, okay? It was created more or less 1984. I'm sure in the room there are people who weren't even born in 1984. Well, I don't know. Raise your hand if you were born after 1984. Okay, that guy, but... Well, you see, a lot, right? I mean, wow, okay. So 1984, I was born. I was still a kid, so that's okay. Uh, you have the model, right? The model is wherever your data comes from. So you can have a database, you can have a, a web service. In 1984, they didn't really have web services, I guess. Um, you can have all kinds of um, data, even the, even the device itself, right? If you walk around, if you walk around, you have a GPS on, then you will get some data, which is basically where you are, okay? And then you get some events, and then you need to react to those events. And then, of course, we have the view. The view is whatever the user is actuating, right? And so you have some controls, you have some buttons, some, I don't know, text boxes, etc. Then in the middle, you have the controller. And the controller in MVC is a very, very important object. It is going to control whatever, well, to react to whatever the user does in the view. Okay, so it's going to react to events. For example, the user clicks a button or enters some text. All right? It's also going to update the view. So whenever something happens, you need to update the view and say, well, I don't know if the user clicks a checkbox, for example, then some part of the UI is going to be disabled or enabled, these kind of, of things. And it's also going to interact with the model. So it's going to read and update data, okay? Save 
uh, save data or maybe read some data. It's going to react to events from the model. For example, maybe there is something coming from the web, like a notification, or maybe there is some um, events from the device itself. Like I said before, the user is walking around and then some events come from the GPS modules, these kind of things. Now, this is a very, very popular pattern and a very widely used pattern nowadays. So, for example, if you go to Windows, the view is made in XAML. It's a markup language, okay? It's an XML-based language. If you go on iOS, we have storyboards. Again, XML-based documents. Android, we have Android Xamarin. We have AXML, but basically Android, it's XML, okay? And then you compose your view. Why do we have so much XML in the view? Mostly it's because of the visual designers. Visual designers are tools, and tools love XML. But at the same time, this XML is kind of human friendly. You can read it and you can even type, especially for Android and Windows, you can type directly. For iOS, we don't really do that, but. So that's the view. Now the controller, this is where you handle your events, okay? So in Windows, we talk about the code behind. It's XAML.CS, okay, C sharp. In iOS, we have controller, literally, they are called view controllers. In Android, we have activities or we have fragments, these kind of things, all right? So out of the box, this is what you get. Now, when we move to MVVM, the controller is still there. The only thing is that we are going to try to make it smaller. We are going to try to remove some of its power because having a very, very powerful object is not a good idea in, a, in an application in general. Instead, we have a view model and really, the main difference is how the view model and the view communicate. And here we are going to use something called data binding. And data binding is kind of the key of the MVVM pattern, if you want. If you have a system which doesn't have data binding at all, MVVM doesn't quite make sense. Okay? And then we also have something called commands, which is a way to execute code whenever something happens. Like, for example, the user clicks a button and then some code is executed directly in the view model. Now, you can ask yourself, why do we want to use MVVM in Xamarin? Because I told you, out of the box, you get MVC. Okay, and MVC is a proven pattern. I mean, it works okay. So why would you want to do the extra effort? Well, there are a few reasons. So like I said, we have some kind of markup. This is a view. We have some kind of C sharp. This is a controller. And really, this is where the problem lies. The controller is very, very difficult to unit test because the controller is going to interact directly with the view. And so, for example, you're going to have a button dot click uh, plus equals if you do some C sharp and then some event handler. That's not something that you can simulate in a unit test, at least not easily. Okay? Maybe let's say you want, to show, you, you want to show a message box, for example. Well, how do you do that in a unit test? You can show a message box and then have the unit test confirm and then assert the result. It doesn't work. Okay? Also, this code, mostly you can share it across platforms. So if you have a code, a controller using a button for Android, you can take that code and put it on iOS because the button is a different button, okay? The button for Android doesn't work on, on iOS. So you're going to have this issue here. So instead, the view model, because we are going to abstract things there, is going to be mostly unit testable and mostly shareable, okay? So what we are going to try to do is go from a classic Xamarin architecture where you have the model which is shared. It's already a fair amount of code, okay? It can be 50% easily. But then on top of that, you will still have the three silos for the view for Android, Windows, and iOS, for example. So what we are going to try to do now is reduce the amount of code that can be shared. And then we are going to replace that with a view model where we can share the view. And then we are going to use data binding to decouple the layers. Okay? Cool. So I want to show you a demo. And the demo, what we are going to do is take a small Oops, hold on. We are going to take a small um, application and then we are going to refactor it to MVVM. Like this, you will see some of the uh, differences. So what I did here, I have an application. This is called Hello Android. And this application is going to react to a button click. Okay, so here I'm in the activity. I'm in the controller of the view. I'm going to find my text view. And then I'm going to write, please wait. I'm going to create an HTTP client to connect to the web. And then I'm going to connect to this website here. 
And this website is my drone gallery because I'm doing some drone videos and pictures. And so, for example, this is about an hour from my place in Switzerland. And as you can see, I have uh, somewhere a number of views. Uh, not sure why I cannot see them here. Oh, here, 272 views, okay? So I'm very proud of the number of views and you have no idea, it changes all the time, right? Like every week I have two views additional. So it's really taking me by surprise. And of course, every time I wake up in the morning, I need to check how many views I have, right? It's my life. So, and of course I want to check that on every device. I want iOS, Android, and Windows, okay? So we're going to make a small application which uh, does that. So this application is going to connect to this web page, load the HTML. I'm going to do some brute force HTML parsing here. It's very annoying. This is code that I really don't want to write three times, okay? I want to have that once and not touch it anymore. And in order to do that, I'm going to go on my solution, and then I'm going to add MVVM Lite to the application. Now, everything I'm showing you, you could do it also with MVVM Cross or with Prism or with other frameworks. But here I want to use MVVM Lite, so I go to NuGet, I search MVVM Lite, I'm going to add it to my project. By the way, I just published a .NET standard version of MVVM Lite, so if you prefer to use .NET standard for your libraries, you can also do that. Just check my blog, everything's on there. Now it downloads the package. Here we go. And now I'm ready to roll. So in addition to downloading the, the assemblies, it also added a folder called view model. And inside you have main view model and the view model locator. We'll take a look at those objects in a moment. Now I'm going to add a portable class library. And so this is where you could use a .NET standard assembly if you prefer. But here in that case, I want to use a portable class library just because it works pretty well as well. And I'm going to call that data. And this is going to be my model and my view model layer. So I want to also work on Windows Universal 10. I have Android, I have iOS, everything I need. And now I'm going to add a reference to data into my main application. All right. And then I want to remove this class here and I'm going to transfer this view model folder into the data. So I'm pressing shift, which means I'm really moving the files. Okay, I'm not duplicating them because I want to have those view model and the model shared everywhere. And now the other thing I want to do in terms of infrastructure, I will use a unit test application as well because I want to be able to unit test my view model. So I'm going to add another project here, add new project, and I'm going to go on the test and I'm going to use a unit test project for .NET framework. Here you could use whatever you prefer, NUnit, XUnit, anything. In that case, I'm just going to keep it simple here. And of course, we also want a reference to the data library into the unit test project because this is what we are going to test really. All right. Cool. Now the last thing I need to do, I need to add MVVM Lite to those two libraries as well. So the reason why I didn't do it before is because I want to show you the difference. If you go on MVVM Lite here and you search and you browse, you will see a number of projects because there are quite a few projects who use MVVM Lite. But here, for example, you see MVVM Lite libs, okay? And so there is a difference between libs and the MVVM Lite package. Basically, the difference is that the MVVM Lite package refers to the libs, so it's going to take the libs, and in addition, it's going to add the view model folder, what we call scaffolding, basically doing some stuff around it, okay? So now for the data and for the unit test, I just need the libraries. I don't need, the, I don't need another view model folder. I already have one, okay? So I'm taking the MVVM Lite libs here, adding that to data and to unit test project. You see it's already installed in the Hello Android, so I don't need it. And then I'm going to say install, accept the license, and then we are good to go. So now in terms of the infrastructure of my application, I'm ready. Now I can start to add code. So inside my data library, I'm going to add a new folder. Let's call that model. 
And inside here, I want to work really cleanly, so I'm going to add an interface for my YouTube service. Okay? I'm going to take the code from the activity and put it in this YouTube service. So let's start by adding an interface here, and I'm going to add, call that IUCube service. And this is going to be the definition for my service, if you want. So here what I'm going to add, I'm going to have just one method called refresh. And you see this is going to be a task of string. So basically it's going to be an asynchronous method which returns a string. And the string is going to be the number of views. And then I'm going to implement this interface. So why do I do an interface? It's because I want to have the possibility to have multiple implementations of the service. I want to have the runtime service which is connecting to the YouTube service. But I also want to be able to test what happens in case there is an error, okay? Now, I can't really take the phone and call Google and say, hey, can you just shut down YouTube for a moment because I'm going to run my unit test? Okay, they, I tried. They don't like it. <laughs> they, yeah, they kind of find it annoying. The third time I, I called, they said, we will, you know, stop calling, right? We'll call the police, right? So, okay. So instead, we are going to simulate the YouTube service. That's why I have the interface. It allows me to simulate, and my view model doesn't know about that. It doesn't care. It's just using the refresh method. That's all, okay? So I'm going to implement here a new class, YouTube service. Oops, service. I'm going to say it implements iYouTube service, and then Let's implement the interface. Here we go. And then what I'm going to do here, basically I'm going to take the code that I had in the activity. So everything from here. Let's take that as well here. I'm going to just put it into my YouTube service now. So I'm going to create the HTTP client. Let's add the reference. Oops, it doesn't want to. Yeah, that happens sometimes. This is, uh, let me see, activity. This is system.net.http. This is what we want. Here we go. Then I'm going to call the get string async. This is an awaitable method, so I need to make this async. All right. And then instead of assigning directly here, I'm going to just return the past HTML value. All right. And so now the cool thing is that this code here is going to be shared by all my systems, so I don't need to rewrite that many times. Okay, now what we want to do is start to implement the view model. So first of all, let's go to the view model locator. And view model locator is it's an object where I like to do some kind of setup if you want. By the way, this object was created automatically when I downloaded MVVM Lite, if you remember, okay? So this is a default implementation if you want. So now inside here, I'm going to register my service. So what I say here is basically every time that you want, oops, every time that you want an iYouTube service, please use the YouTube service which I just created. Okay, and then I register the main view model and then inside my main view model, I'm going to say, by the way, when you create the view model, please give me an iYouTube service. So let's do that now. Let's go to the view model. This is my constructor here. And now we are going to start creating things. So the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to add the property which is going to hold the result of the operation. This is going to be what, I, what is going to be displayed in the UI. Okay. Now, when you install MVVM Lite on your machine, you saw I installed before using NuGet. But there is also an extension for Visual Studio. So if you go to Tools, Extension and Updates, here you will see in the dialog, there is an MVVM Lite package here. Now, what this package does is add a few things to Visual Studio. For example, it will add a template, a series of templates. There is a template for Android, for iOS, for WPF. There is one for Windows 10 Universal. And so those are basically applications that you can get started with. But probably even more importantly, there is also some code snippet. So it's going to help you to type faster. 
Okay? For example, if I want to add a property which is going to raise a property change event, I can just type MVVM, and then you see all the snippets which are coming here. Here you have a, a large number of snippets, okay? And so these snippets, I'm going to use them so that I don't need to write the same thing many times. I'm going to take MVVM INPC, I notify property change, set lambda, it's just different variations of the same property if you want. Now I press tab to expand the snippet. You see that it typed for me, okay? And now I can call that result. This is going to be the name of my property. I use tab to go from field to field. This is going to be a string. And then I'm going to initialize that with nothing yet. All right. Now my property is ready. It's going to raise a property change event using this set method, which is a helper method by MVVM, right? So basically now I can use data binding to connect to that. Next thing I'm going to do is add a command because I want to actually execute the refresh method. Okay, so I'm going to type MVVM again. And this time I'm going to type MVVM R for relay, relay command. Okay, relay command is an implementation of the command. Let's call that the refresh command. Oops, here. Here we go. And now I'm able to type some code. Just going to add the namespace. And so what this code is going to do, it's going to first set the result to please wait. Then it's going to connect to the service and call the refresh method. Okay, remember we implemented this, this refresh method before. I need to make that asynchronous. And then it's going to catch an exception if there is one. And if there is an exception, the specification of my application says I want the result to display the exception message, the error, okay? This is a specification I got from my project manager in that case. Cool, so now I need the service. This service, I need to get it into the main view model. So how can I do that? Well, we are going to use dependency injection here. Okay, I'll make a quick refresh about that in a moment. I'm going to say every time I want to use my main view model, I need an instance of the, of the iYouTube service and I mistyped, here we go. And like this, the system, the application is going to know, oh, I need to save. I need to create an instance of this iYouTube service and give it to the main view model. And then the main view model is going to save that. And then later it's going to use that here to call the service, okay? Now you see the beauty of that is that the main view model is asking an iYouTube service. It doesn't care about the implementation of the YouTube service. It can be the runtime service which calls YouTube, but it can also be a test service which doesn't make me call YouTube to say, hey, can you shut down your service for a moment? Where I, can, where I will be able to simulate an error. Okay, so this is great for unit tests. We are also going to be able to simulate data for the designer, for example. I'll show you that in a moment, which is pretty cool. Okay, so now let's implement the unit test, okay? So I can go into my unit test project, and inside here, I'm going to just remove this method, and what I want to test is two scenarios. The first scenario, I want to test that if everything goes well, the result of the refresh method is saved into the result property. And then the second scenario I want to test, I want to test that if there is an exception, the message of the exception will be saved into the result property. Those are my two scenarios I want to unit test right now. So I'm going to go into my unit test here and I'm going to add a few things. First of all, I add a constant. This is going to be the result in case everything goes well. And I create that as a public constant because I want to be able to assert this value. Then I'm going to add the refresh method uh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Remember I told you I have an iYouTube service, and then I told you I want to create another implementation of the iYouTube service, a test implementation. Let's do that right now. So first, before I create my unit test, I need here to add a new class, and this class we are going to call it test YouTube oh, geez. Tube service. Here we go. Voila. And now this one is going to also implement i 
YouTube service, like before. OK. Voila. OK, and here I'm going to add the constant. So this is going to be my test service. I only use that for tests. And then I will have the refresh method, which is the implementation of my iYouTube service, OK? Now, this one needs to return a task of string, all right? So this is basically, by a sense, it's an asynchronous method. But here in the unit test, I want to call this method synchronously, because asynchronous method in unit test, even though you can do that, it works, uh, especially in the latest versions of Visual Studio. But still, it's a little bit easier if you do it synchronously. So to do that, I'm going to use this object, task completion source, OK? It's a very convenient object in .NET. Basically, it's going to return a task. So it's exactly what I want. You can await this task. But basically, where as soon as you call set result, the task is going to be executed. All right? So basically, you don't need to run this asynchronously, which is a little bit easier. So here, this is a scenario where every, everything goes well. OK, I have my task completion source. I set the result to the result passed. And then everything is running correctly. Now, I need to modify this service to execute the error scenario, the exception scenario. So I will add another constant. And this one is exposing the exception message so that I can assert that the exception message is copied properly. And then I'm going to modify my service to force an error. So I'm going to say here, let's add a constructor. I'm going to say that I have the possibility to force an exception, OK, in case, some, in case I decide that I want something to go wrong. I want to force something to go wrong. And then in that case, my refresh method is going to be modified a little bit. So I'm going to say, if my user wants the error to be forced, I'm going to set an exception on the task, which is going to throw the exception. And this exception is going to carry the exception message, which is exposed as a constant. And so I can assert the message. And then the result, which is the correct scenario, the scenario where everything is going well, here is going to be inside there. All right? So now I have my test YouTube service. And now I can use it in my unit test. And so I will have two scenarios. I will have a success scenario where I say, OK, I'm going to create a test YouTube service. Then I'm going to create a main view model using this service. The main view model, remember, it doesn't know if it's using a real YouTube service or if it's using a test YouTube service. It doesn't care. OK, it's just using the interface. Then I'm going to execute the command. And here in this scenario, everything is going to run fine. And so I'm going to assert that the result property, which then I'm going to data bind to my UI, is going to be equal to result passed. Now, the other scenario is the exception scenario. And so this is another test method. I'm going to create my test YouTube service. But this time, I, I give the value true to the constructor. So I'm forcing an error. Then I'm executing the refresh command. And then I'm going to verify that the result property per the specification of my project manager is going to be equal to the exception message. Like this, my user is going to be informed if something goes wrong. OK, I can test by building the application. If I go to my test explorer, it should discover those two methods and show them to me. Just takes a second to finish the build. And then after that, we can run the unit test and verify that everything's running fine. So by doing all that, we modified a very simple application to MVVM. Now, it's a little bit complex, OK? But the good thing is that now we have a healthy basis to continue implementing, to, to continue adding some features. Here are my two methods. If I click on Run All, if I didn't make another error somewhere, it should turn green, which means my tests are successful. OK, well, oh, thanks. <laughs> Cool, so now what we are going to do is use that into my application. So remember, this is my Android application, OK? So the first thing I'm going to do, I'm just going to import my view model locator because this is my central point. So in Windows, we do that in app.xaml. This is the application object, OK? Then you have your view model locators, and you can, you, you can do your data binding. 
In iOS, you also have an application object. It's inside the main.cs. You might have seen that, okay? Application object is like a central object. In Android, there is no such central object, so we can just add one. Let's go and add a new class. I'm going to call that app.cs. All right. Public. Here we go. And then I'm going to add my locator, which is, like I said, my basically my point of entry for everything MVVM. Now I can go into the main activity, and then I can start modifying my code. So here I have my button, I have my text. I can completely remove the button click because I'm not going to use a click event anymore, okay, which is an advantage because I'm going to be completely decoupled here. Instead, I'm going to have here a list of binding, and those are going to be the oops, wrong binding. Those are going to be the data bindings that we will create. Here we go, and we are going to take the Galasoft MVVM Lite bindings, okay? And then I'm going to create those bindings. So I'm going to have a binding between my result property, which, if you remember, it's raising the property change event. So I, you, I can use that in the data binding on the main object of the locator. The main object is my main view model, okay? And the target of the data binding is a text property of a text view. So data binding in Android. And then the next, the last thing I need to do is execute the command. And so I'm going to say whenever the button is clicked, please, using the set command method, please execute the refresh command. Those two methods, set binding and set command, those are extension methods that come with the MVVM Lite NuGet package. So now you can use bindings and commands in MVVM Lite in Android and in iOS directly. Later we'll see in Xamarin Forms how you can use that as well. Okay? Cool. All right, so the application is running. So here I have the application. I can go to my Hello Android, have a little bit of UI, click me, please wait, that works. And then we see that after a while we have the number of views, so that works. All right? I also have an implementation of this for iOS and for Windows. And so you'll get the code. Everything is on GitHub, right? I'll give you the repo. So in iOS, what we would do, and by the way, this is exactly the same, right? I have my data portable class libraries. This is my, I didn't modify this code at all. This is the same code we had. Still have the unit test application. But now, this is the Android app. If I go in iOS, inside the main.cs, this is the application object. I have my view model locator point of entry for the MVVM like bind for the MVVM data binding. And then inside the view controller, I also have a data binding in iOS. Again, between the result property, and this time it's a UI label, it's a different object, and the command. And if you go in Windows, in Windows we do things in XAML typically. So in app.xaml I have my view model locator declared. And then in main page.xaml, uh, let's not take the the designer. Here I have my data context, and then after that I have the binding to the command, to the refresh command, and I have the binding to the result here. So what we have achieved here is that now we have the code, the, the annoying code, right, the, the parsing code, etc. We have it into a cleanly defined location. We have unit tests on that. So if we extend, we can make sure that we don't break something. Huh? Regression tests are really very, very useful. So you want to test that you didn't break something when you add a feature. And in addition, we have cleanly decoupled the view layer from the view model layer by using data binding. All right? So this is what we achieve. For a small application like that, totally overkill. Huh? I don't blame you if you don't do that for a, a YouTube uh, checking, <laughs> view checking application. But of course, if you want to build on top of that, then very useful. All right. Oh, by the way, let me show you the Windows version of the app uh, here. Here we go. So here I have a Windows who can feel with a command bar. And if I click, please wait. And so it works the same. And the iOS version, you can run it yourself if you want. It's going to run as well. OK. Cool. So let's talk a little bit about abstraction, because we did a little bit of that already. We did the iYouTube service, and then we made two implementations of the iYouTube service, right? Now, this is a service which is going down to the data. But you can also do abstraction when you go up, for example, to show a dialog or to navigate. So what is the issue here? Well, the issue is that if you want to do very simple things like showing a dialog in Android, iOS, and Windows, 
the dialogue is going to look exactly the same, right? You have a title, you have a message, and then you have a number of buttons. Simple enough. But if you look at the implementation of the code needed to do that, it's very, very different. And here I also have Xamarin Forms because Xamarin Forms is going to render to Windows, iOS, and Android. But it is yet another way, okay? You have the display alert method that you can use. So four different ways to show a dialogue. So of course, if you want to use that in a view model, if you support only one platform, well, back then in the WPF days when we wanted to show a dialogue, we did messagebox.show directly in the view model. Very ugly and dirty, but basically uh, nobody cared. It was OK. But of course, if you support multiple platforms, it doesn't work. Then you start having if Android do something, if iOS do something horrible, right? So instead, what, you, what we can do, we can do the same thing that we did with the iYouTube service. We can create an iDialog service, for example. And this iDialog service, we are going to inject it in the view model. Here in the example, I use simple IOC, which is an MVVM light component, but you can use whatever dependent injection framework you want, or you can just do it manually if you prefer, that works. And then we are going to have one implementation of iDialog service per platform that we support. That sounds like a lot of work, but the good thing is that you do this once, you put it in a library, you can reuse it. Or you can use a framework, MVVM like has a dialogue service, MVVM cross has a dialogue service, etc., etc. Okay? Now, the other advantage of doing that is that if you do unit tests on your view model like I did before, remember in my scenario, I just show the error message in the result property, and then through the data binding, it goes to my UI. That's fine, but let's say I want to show a dialogue instead, and then I want the user to confirm the dialogue. Well, I cannot really use the dialog service directly because, again, in my unit test, if, if there is a message box, the unit test is not going to click on the button. It doesn't work. So what I'm going to do instead, I'm going to create another implementation of the dialog service, test dialog service. And this is what I'm going to use in my test. So for example, what you can do in the test dialog service, you can have a property saying dialog was displayed. And then in your test, when the view model calls dialog service dot show error, then you set this property to true. And you can even save the, the string that was passed, the string that was displayed to the user. For example, if you want to test the localization, you want to make sure in your unit test that the correct language was used, okay? Chinese or Bahasa, for that matter, or French or German, etc. okay? So you can test your dialogues quite thoroughly using that. So abstraction is very useful in those scenarios. OK, so MVVM Lite is an open source toolkit. Um, it was created in 2009. It has a set of libraries. So the libraries are, are what you pull through NuGet, OK, MVVM Lite libs. There are some templates. So if you add the extension to Visual Studio, you can do file, new project, new MVVM Lite application for Android, for example. Snippets, for example, the MVVM INPC that we saw before, okay? And then some guidance, so you will find on mvmlight.net, you will find some videos, you will find some articles, etc. About 2,300,000 downloads, so it's pretty popular. The downloads keep going up. And by the way, the code is on CodePlex, but I'm moving that because I'm not sure if you heard, but they are shutting down CodePlex. And so I'm, I'm moving everything to GitHub, which will happen in the next few uh, weeks probably, and so keep posting on my Twitter or my blog, and then you'll see that when it's ready. Components, not really important. The MIT license, so you can use that basically for commercial project if you want. Basically, the MIT license pretty much says you can do whatever you want, just don't call me in the middle of the night if you have a problem. But I take email and Twitter messages, so it's fine. It's part of the .NET Open Source Foundation, which is a, um, it's an, uh, an organism which is independent from Microsoft, but sponsored by Microsoft, and uh, it's quite good. Uh, CodePlex hosting, like I said, it's moving to GitHub. I take feedback and contribution, so you can do pull requests. Uh, I am quite conservative because so many people are using it these days, and I'm very scared of breaking something, okay? So I tend to add stuff very, very slowly, and also I want to keep it light. I don't want to make MVVM heavy. I'm not interested into that. So I, I like to keep things light, so I try to avoid adding too many things. But I encourage people to build on top of it, and that's why I don't want to break things. Okay, we talked about MVVM, we talked about abstraction. Let's talk about data binding a little bit. 
Data binding is a tricky subject because, like I said, if you don't have data binding, MVVM doesn't really make sense, okay? So what is really data binding? Well, it's a relationship between two properties. You have a source property and you have a target property. And when you establish the data binding, it's going to make sure that those properties are synchronized. When the source changes, the target is going to change as well. But the good thing is that it's a loose coupling. So when you do things with, a, with an event in .NET, you create a strong coupling. And then you have basically a strong relationship between the source of the event and the target of the event. And that can cause a memory leak, possibly. But data bindings work in a loose manner. And so the source of the binding is never going to oppose the target of the binding being garbage collected. Worst case scenario, your UI is going to stop responding. So basically, if you have a clock, and then, of course, you garbage collect the source of the clock, of course, the, the, the UI is going to stop running. But your application is not going to crash. Okay. So it's a loose coupling. It's a quite a convenient way to do things. So there are a few advantages in using that. The first advantage is that if you want to maintain and extend your code, it makes things quite easy because your objects are going to be smaller. They are going to be neatly decoupled. And so you can have one team working on one part of, for example, on the model and the view model, and then another team working on the view. And then you use data binding to connect the dots. So it also makes things better for collaboration between teams, OK? It's good for unit testing because, like we saw before, now you can test your main view model as well. We can test that the correct error message was displayed in the correct location, for example, which before was happening in the controller, and so you couldn't test it in the controller, OK? It's also good for sharing because, just like we saw before, the view model code is going to be shared between the platform now. All right, and so you have more code that can be shared. Now, interestingly, it's also better for design because it allows you to do a cool set of things. If you're in Blend, which is on Windows, you're going to be able to show a lot more information in your designer. I'm going to show you that in a moment. But even if you're not in Blend, remember the iYouTube service. Now I can do an iDesign. I can do a design YouTube service. And then I can simulate whatever case I want. Let's imagine that you have an error message which is very long. OK, maybe I need to update my UI for that scenario. Let's imagine that you do a contact list, an address book application. Let's imagine that, we, that you have a user who doesn't have any friends. You want to show a message to cheer him up, right? Like, hey, don't jump, guy, OK? You, it's OK, just go out, make friends, all right? Show a nice message. This is a scenario that you cannot test in a, in a runtime application. You cannot call the database administrator and say, can you delete all the friends just for a moment? I want to check, right? So again, this is a scenario that you can use a design, YouTube, uh, a design address book service, for example, for. Or let's imagine that you want to test Mark Zuckerberg's phone, and then he has like millions of friends. You want to test that the application is still running, right? So again, this is a, a design scenario. Let's imagine that you have a friend with a very long name. Probably you don't want to show three dots because it's kind of offensive, right? So you want to show maybe some hyphens or I, I don't know, any design scenario. So you can also use this kind of architecture for this kind of design scenarios, all right? Cool. So data binding principle, it's based on iNotify property change interface. OK, in MVVM Lite, we use a set method typically to do that. Or you can use a race property change method. There are a few ways. It's declarative programming, which means that you declare the bindings when the page is created, and then they will be evaluated on demand. For example, here is an example. This is a XAML, so for Windows, OK? We have the exact same example here for iOS on or Android. So we have the binding keyword, which uh, here we use a set binding method. Then you have the source object, which is a selected item, OK? Then we have the target. The source property, sorry, the name. And then we have the target object, which is display text. And then we have the target property, which is a text. One of the beauty of data binding is that selected item here and here, this is going to change all the time. Okay, This is data bound to a list. So every time the user is clicking on an item, the selected item property is changing inside the view model. But this is no problem. This is a composed binding. When that changes, the binding is going to reattach to the correct value. So you have everything dynamically. 
All right, commanding, we used a command before, the refresh command, okay? So it's based on I command interface, a relay command object that I use in an implementation of I command. It allows, again, loose coupling, so you don't have a strong coupling between the button and the command. So again, if you want to delete part of the UI, no problem, it's going to just work. You can pass one parameter, not more. Typically, it's not really a problem because you can also use data binding to pass more parameters if you need. Now, a nice side effect is that the command from the view model, you can say, I want to disable the control for a while. That's very useful. For example, if you do an asynchronous operation, you connect to the YouTube service, you quickly disable the control. Like this, your, your user is not going to click three times and overload the server, okay? All right, there are, of course, some disadvantages of data binding. And really, the main disadvantage is performance. They are slower to create and to resolve because they typically use some reflection. Okay, reflection is slower. If you're familiar with Windows, they have a new type of binding now called X colon bind. So we had binding before, you can still use that. But there is this new type of binding, we call them compile binding. And this is really purely for performance reason. Okay, they are going to be faster. In Android and iOS, we don't have that. Typically, it's not really a problem because you have a few bindings on your UI. But if you have a scenario, let's say you have a list and your list is not virtualized, which is probably a bad idea to start with. And then on each cell of the list, you have 10 bindings. At some point, it's going to start, you know, slowing down, right? Now, I would question your design in that case. But there are scenarios where you might want to say, well, maybe data binding is not the best, the best solution. In that case, what do you do? You fall back to the MVC model, and then you just go and set directly the values of, uh, of the UI, okay? Which means that suddenly you cannot really unit test and you cannot share that code anymore. But of course, when we want performance, sometimes we have to do some trade backs, okay? Typically, I would start with data binding. If you see that you have a problem, then you can always fall back to, a, to a, another scenario without data binding. The other scenario, which is a little bit difficult, it's a little bit more difficult to understand because it's a loose scenario. It's an uh, it's, uh, abstracted scenario. So for example, if you have your property, you know that the property is changing, you know that it's raising the property change event, but your UI still doesn't work. Well, there is an error somewhere. The binding is going to work anyway. Maybe you did a typo or maybe, I mean, nowadays typos are easily, easy to detect because you have some um, support in Visual Studio. But back then, when we didn't have that support, typically you were typing your binding in XAML, you did a typo, your binding was not working. Finding those errors is a little bit more difficult. But if you have experience, normally it's not too much of a problem and that works pretty well. In terms of support, on XAML Windows, we have native data binding support. It's out of the box. In Xamarin Forms, we have that as well. I'll show you an example in a moment. Xamarin iOS and Xamarin Android, they don't have data binding. That's why you install a package, for example, MVVM Lite. MVVM Cross has that as well. Prism, um, they support only Xamarin Forms. And there are other packages, for example, CSLA.net, if you use that for uh, enterprise, they also have these kind of things. Interestingly, you have now a lot of data binding talk in HTML. For example, if you do Angular, they use data binding these days. And so they have a JavaScript object, which is kind of a view model. And then they have some syntax in the HTML, and then you can bind. And this all comes from the, the beauty that is WPF, where all this was invented. So basically, we see that everybody is kind of profiting from each other, which is a good thing, collaboration. All right, I'm going to show you a little bit more code. So those applications that I'm going to show you now, they are actually available to you for download. So there is a GitHub repo. You'll get the, the links and everything. And so if you go to, uh, let me show you the application first. So I have this application, which is, which I call Flowers, which is a fairly complete sample. Except, uh, here we go. So here is a Flowers application, all right? This is an application which is going to connect to a data service. There is a refresh button. There is here this last loaded, which at the moment is set to never. If I click, you see my button is going to be disabled for a moment. This is through the command. It's loading the list. Now it says when it was loaded last, you have the list of flowers. I'm going to click. See a, a master detail application. We have here the 
description and then there is a commenting system you can add a comment and for example hello from Singapore here don't want to forget the N let's save the comment again the button is disabled while saving and then you go back and then you see the comment all right we have the same application in Windows as well and there is also an iOS uh, application so here I can refresh here again it says last loaded be your kid let's go there is a little bit here and if I go down you see the message that I just entered from here I can also hello again from Windows and save and same experience right so this is all things that you can unit test it's all consistent and so the code for that is inside here few things I want to show you here first thing you have here the data which is a portable class library again it could be a .NET standard as well we have the flower service and so this is what we did before we connect to a service here we parse here this is a URL that we prefer that we prepare this is written in JSON so here we pass some JSON we can deserialize then we have also a design implementation so you know I told you you can have the iFlower service, you can have multiple implementations, you can have a unit test. Here I have a design implementation. And what I'm going to do here is create a number of flowers with a dummy name and a dummy description and a dummy image. And the beautiful thing here is that if you go to your view model layer, to your view model locator, here I'm going to say if I'm in design mode, if I want to use the design data, please use the design flower service instead of the actual flower service and now this allows me to see the result directly in blend in the visual studio designer or here for windows 10 and so that's very convenient because it allows me to directly go here and do my changes so if you implement for desktop wpf or if you implement a windows um, universal application you can go and then you can say what happens if I set here the width to 80 what happens if I take the value here and set the color to something really ugly like I don't know uh, like this bright green here okay now you see what I, why I'm not a designer so basically you can do your test here mm -hmm. directly now if that is not going to work in the Android or iOS designer because Android and iOS designer are a little bit more primitive than the Visual Studio designer, which is running code. But what you can do is still go to your view model locator. You set this property here to true. And now you're forcing your application to use the design, the design flower service. So you run the application in the emulator. And like this, you don't need to connect to a service. You don't need to call the administrator to say, can you shut down the service for a moment? I want to show an error. You don't need to check what happens if I don't have any flowers, what, ha what happens if I have a lot of flowers. You can simulate all that directly in your application. Okay? All right, so this is a flower scenario. You will get all that. Now, if you want to know more about data binding in general, there is also a Xamarin binding sample. And here I have a number of scenarios. I have simple data binding. I have binding with custom events. For example, if you want to use a focus change event or if you want to use a click event instead of the standard. I have conversion. So you can convert between, for example, a string and a Boolean or a string and whatever you want or any, any type and whatever you want. Uh, there are also some error scenarios. What happens if the target is no? What happens if there is a, an error in the binding, etc., etc. And so you can check this as well. Now, I really want to finish this presentation by talking to you about Xamarin Forms, because Forms is also quite popular, and it's a nice way to build, for example, business applications or maybe more internal applications in Xamarin as well. So Xamarin Forms, for those of you who are not familiar with it, it's a package on top of Xamarin. So you have Xamarin iOS, Xamarin Android, Windows, and then on top of that, you have Xamarin Forms. This allows you to write the UI once only, and then this UI is going to be rendered to iOS, rendered to Android, and rendered to Windows. Now, the rendering process, there is one inconvenience, is that you don't have control on that. So your UI, you have less control on the UI. 
you can take control by additional effort by implementing what they call custom renders. Okay? Look into that. It's actually pretty good for certain scenarios. For example, if you have an enterprise application where the design is a little bit less critical than the customer-facing application. For customer-facing application, you want to have perfect design. For an enterprise app, it's a little bit less critical. Okay? Or maybe you do a prototype. Okay, you have a, a service that you want to test, you do a prototype on that. Why not do it in Xamarin Forms? Then it runs on all the platforms immediately. Then you can show it to your boss and say, hey, can I have some budget to do uh, you know, a nicer UI, for example. In Xamarin Forms, they have data binding out of the box. So it's like Windows. Well, actually, it's almost like Windows. But it's going to be a lot more like Windows because it builds in May or April this year. Microsoft announced that they have now something called the XAML Standard 1.0. It's a little bit like .NET Standard, ex except it's for XAML. It's a specification which says that everybody which uses XAML, which at the moment is Windows and Xamarin Forms, has to follow the same rules. And so in the future, you're going to be able to take some WPF code, plug it into your Xamarin Forms, and it should just work. Right now, there are a few differences. For example, the data context in Xamarin Forms, they call it binding context, but it's the same object, really. It's just a name. And there are a few things if you want to bind to a UI element. It's a little bit tricky. More information here. Take a look. But the cool thing is that if you use, for example, MVVM Lite or MVVM Cross, well, again, you can do that. So here you have access to another project called flowers.forms. This is using the exact same portable class library than the other project, the Flowers project. But here the client is built in Xamarin Forms. And so if I go to my main page, it looks very much like Universal Windows or WPF. It's almost the same, like I said before. Here I have a data binding. Here I have a data binding. Here I have a command binding. Okay, So you see this is using the same thing. So if you use MBVM Lite out of the box, you can do WPF, you can do Universal Windows, you can do Xamarin Forms, you can do classic Android, classic iOS, using exactly the same principles. Make sense? All right. Cool. So I have a few resources for you. So if you want to check it out, if you go to those addresses, there are a series of MSDN articles that I wrote about the components of MVVM Lite. The, the series is a, a little bit older now, but the, uh, it's still absolutely up to date. You have my Perl side course, which you want to uh, check out if you're interested in digging a little bit deeper. It's, uh, I think, four and a half hours uh, of uh, content about MVVM Lite. The documentation, the code is on CodePlex. It's going to move to GitHub. So again, check my Twitter and uh, those two presentations at Evolve. In conclusion, if you want to use MVVM, the advantage is that you increase the surface of code that you can share and unit test. Okay, so you make your application more, basically more solid. You can improve the collaboration between your teams. All right, you can have one team working on the view model, one team on the model, one team on the view. Then you connect the dots using data bindings. You abstract the differences between the platforms, and you also increase the designability like I showed you, for example, in the Visual Studio Designer or by simulating special scenarios. MVVM Lite is going to speed up repetitive work. It's a very well-known component now with a large number of users. So if you go, for example, on Stack Overflow, tag your question with MVVM Dash Lite, people are going to reply to it. And we have great collaboration with Microsoft and Xamarin, which is also Microsoft, of course, um, and uh, really nice things going on. All right, I want to thank you for your attention. If you have questions, I will stick around a little bit more. Otherwise, Twitter down there, El Bunion, my website and my blog, mbmlight.net for additional content. Thank you very much for your attention and have a great end of the conference. Thank you.